audience, welcome. It is so good to see you. We are uh, interviewing someone that I think will, uh, if you do not know already, you will be so glad that you do now. And uh, this is uh, Bob Walter. And he is uh, just, he's executive director and board president of the Joseph Campbell Foundation. We'll be telling you about that today. And uh, we just welcome you. Bob, it's so good to have you. It's great to be with you, Nelda. It really is, even if we don't have margaritas this time. Oh, if only. I don't think the team will let us, but you know. <laughs> so the last time you and I saw each other, because you have such a love for theater, was at the premiere opening night of The Prom on Broadway. That's been a while, so it is so good to see you. Tell us a little bit. You started in theater and arts, uh, and then... I guess it was 1979 that your uh, life took another interesting turn. So could you fill us in a little bit on all that? Oh, I, I'll be glad to. Um, it, it, this little story actually is, is a, an example of uh, Campbell's aphorism of, of needing to let go of the life you've planned in order to have the life that's waiting for you. So let, let me back up to um, earlier, to uh, late 1977, early 1978. Uh, I was working in a theater. My wife, Nola, who you know, um, was uh, also in, in the theater. And, uh, but I was getting restless in New York, and I started to think, you know, I'd like to, to maybe get back to why I got into theater, which paradoxically was not to work on Broadway, although I loved it, but to create what I thought of as secular rituals. You know, coming out of the, out of the 60s and seeing how, how uh, concerts and, and, and uh, festivals brought people together. Um, I, I was interested in, in theater as, as a way to bring people together in real time. So I, I began to look around for uh, wh where this might happen, and I ended up taking a job as producing director of the Little Theater of Savannah. Now, my wife and I began to, Noel and I began to uh, pack up. And uh, the first thing that happened, which should have been assigned to me and wasn't, is I got a call saying uh, the theater burnt down. And... Uh, I, I, I said, well, the theater, such wow. as it was, was this little old converted golf club. And I said, that's okay. You know, I, I really like doing theater in found spaces, and we'll just have a fundraising campaign and build a new theater. Okay, forward hope. This is, the, this is where we're going. We're going <laughs> to Savannah. And then uh, three days before we were supposed to leave, uh, Nola came back, and she said, I, I, I just got offered a job today. And I said, well, isn't it interesting? As we're leaving town, you get offered a job. And I said, well, what was it? And she said, I was asked to be executive director of the Theater of the Open Eye. And I said, Nola, that's Joe Campbell and Gene Erdman's theater. And she said, yeah, I know. And I said, you've got to take it. Uh, you've got to do that. So she took the job and I went to Savannah. And I started a campaign, did all this other stuff, brought in big names of built a company that was half New York and half local. And about two, uh, now we're into 1979. And I came back to New York to cast the next season and also to attend uh, an opening night and celebration for a new show that Gene Erdman, Joseph Campbell's wife, and Nola had put on. And following the show, we went to dinner um, at the New York Athletic Club. And so it was Joe Campbell and Gene Erdman my wife, Nola Haig, and I. And there was another couple there I'd never met before, a man named Alfred Vandermark and his wife, Margaret Hoswell, who was an opera singer. Over the course of the dinner, which was supposed to be celebrating this opening, um, I, I heard Fred and Joe started this conversation, and I learned that, that Joseph Campbell had been working on this magnum opus for like five years. Fred was a publisher at McGraw-Hill, and Fred ran a studio in Lucerne, Switzerland, where he produced large, illustrated, lavish co-publications. And, the, and this, this book, which I learned was called The Historical Atlas of World Mythology, was being done there. I also learned that the day before, McGraw-Hill had told Fred Vandermark to shut the studio down immediately. And so he closed it, and everybody dispersed. And the conversation at the table was, what are we going to do with five years of work on this incompleted book? And, uh, and Fred, Fred said, I can't take it. He worked out of, of a, a one office at McGraw-Hill. And Joe said, Fred, number one, I don't have room. I, he lived in a two-room apartment with his wife. Uh, 
the bedroom was his study and the living room they had a, a double bed they slept on and they pulled, they took a you know a card table and set it up for breakfast he said i have no place to put it and so this conversation went on well, what are we going to do you know we, we need to get it out of there because they're going to shut the studio shut down everybody's gone but these there's these boxes so th that 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 was the dinner table conversation uh and it, and the meal ended with no resolution uh, two days later i got a phone call from a friend in 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 atlanta saying are you aware that you're in the paper today and i said no and he said two articles and i said what and and he said what do you want good news or bad and i oh. said good news and he said, well, good news is that um, the, the legislature granted a $500,000 uh, contribution toward the new theater, uh, which was one of, I understood, one of the first bricks and mortar grants for the arts. Um, and, and he said, and the bad news is, he's last night, the board met with a bear quorum and they terminated your contract effective immediately. Ooh. Uh, so, I thought, all yeah. right, we, I had the initial reaction. I had a friend who, who actually was, is the lawyer in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, he, he was my good friend and, 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 and lawyer. And you know, I called him up and you, you will sue him, we'll do all this stuff. And, you know, and, uh, and this was just, I was, all my plans, you know, everything was up in the air, gone. But that weekend, Joe Campbell was doing a, a series of lectures at the Open Eye. And uh, when I was in town, uh, and, and even before Nola took the job there, I, I would drop in when they did lectures. I would kind of be his tech guy. I'd help him run the slides and things. And so I, I went that weekend to, to be there and be supportive. And um, at noon, um, Joe and I snuck off because otherwise he'd never get lunch. He'd just get peppered with questions. And uh, and over, over hamburger and a beer, I said, look, um, my situation has changed. Nola and I have a two room apartment. We have a spare bedroom, a two bedroom apartment. We have a spare bedroom. So if, if you and Fred want to send um, back to me these boxes, I'll do my best to sort of take care of them and maybe, maybe get them in order. And then when you come back from your lecture tour, because he was two days away from leaving for his annual lecture tour, you and Fred can you know, pick up the pieces and go on and make your book. And he said, that's a very interesting uh, offer. Um, why don't you come down on Monday um, to, to the apartment and we'll talk about it. So I went down to his apartment on Monday and, and we, we had a glorious day. We, we went through his library. He was pulling books off the shelf and telling me why it was important. And he showed me how the library was organized. And we went and had an, uh, our, our normal lunch, which was a burger and a beer. Um, came back, did it in the afternoon, about four o'clock. He said, okay, it's time to go see the ladies. And we got on the subway and we went up to the theater and we met our wives and we went out to dinner and, and, and he said, I'll see you in the morning. And the next morning we did it. Tuesday we did it. Wednesday we did it. On Thursday morning, I said, Joe, this is just delightful, but I don't know why we're doing this, you know? And he said, well, if you're going to work with me, you kind of need to know where things are and why they're in this order. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, and he said, so are you working with me? And I said, I guess so. And he said, well, let's go tell Fred. So he got on, we got on the subway. We went up to McGraw Hill. Uh, we, we went to Fred's office. Uh, Joe says, Fred, this is Bob. You met him, you know, the other night. Um, he's going to be the editor. He's going to take over editing this series. Um, you're the publisher. I'm the writer. Onward. And, uh, and oh, by the way, Fred, you're going to pay him. And, uh, and we went back. And, like, two days later, Joe took off on the road. And, uh. And, I, and a, a week or so after that, I got all these boxes of files in French and German and English and mock-ups of pages and, and, and pictures. And, and it was clear that they were working files, meaning there was no apparent order. So, you know, I have a little bit of OCD. So uh, I, I, <laughs> I get my hand in here and I started making organization. And, uh, uh, you know, about six weeks later, Joe came back, Joe and Fred and I, and and uh, I said, go for it, guys. They said, well, can we leave the stuff here? And I said, sure. And we thought Fred would go out and, you know, be hired someplace else, and he would bring along uh, the, the book. And nobody offered him a job. In fact, about um, two months after that, McGraw-Hill fired him. So now we had three of us and, and this book, in which at that point there was probably about 
close to a half a million dollars invested um, and, uh, and nowhere to go. And so uh, long story short, uh, we went around for two and a half, three years. <clears throat> we we self-funded with by taking mortgages on our houses. Um, we lived off our wives, um, Jean, Lola, <laughs> and Margaret, um, and we we tried to get somebody interested. And meanwhile, we kept moving forward on the book, getting more and more in, and nobody really was. Uh, we got turned down more time. It was it was like I felt like I was an actor in the Broadway theater. I was auditioning and auditioning and auditioning and getting no, 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 no. And uh, and so finally, um, uh, about three years into this process, uh, we went to we went for a uh, a holiday lunch at the Century Club, and Fred, uh, Joe said, "Fred, I've been thinking about this. You know, we're going to have to do it ourselves." And uh, Fred said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Well." Well, you know, we're just going to have to start a publishing company. And uh, Fred, Fred came from a long line of Dutch publishers, and he said, oh, that's a we have a publishing company with one book. And uh, Joe <laughs> said, oh, there's, there's dozens of books that, should, that we can publish. Bob and I will give you a list. And we went back to his house, and we made a list of the books that, that he thought should be published, a bunch of his and some other people. and. Uh, we formed a publishing company and we couldn't get anybody to distribute the book. And so after another year, um, uh, we got a call from San Francisco saying, we want to distribute for you. And that was the beginning of a publishing company that we grew from this idea of one book. Um, we, we went from zero to about $5 million in annual revenue um, within four years. And we were cooking along really well. Uh, meantime, in the midst of all this, you know, uh, Joe, Joe, and uh, we'd gotten Joe and Bill Moyers together to agree to do some conversations. Whenever Joe came in from Hawaii, he, he had moved to Hawaii at that point. I was operating out of his apartment, mostly in New York, and uh, so and we got them together. And when they landed on the West Coast, and George Lucas kindly gave us a Skywalker Ranch, and and they filmed these conversations, and this went on for another couple years. Now before then, if I may, before then he was, he was not known, right? Really? Until Moyers did? Not really. He, he, he yeah. had, he had a, a small following. Um, mm -hmm. He hadn't published a book since 1970. Uh, he had more of a following on the West Coast than the East Coast. On the East Coast, uh, there was a certain disdain for the idea of a public intellectual. Uh, which is, which is how he, you know, he, he wasn't writing for the Academy. He wanted uh, it to write for the general reader. Mm -hmm. So out of the blue, all of a sudden, um, Fred Vandermark's wife died. And, uh, and he just said, that's it. Um, I've had it. And six days later, Joe Campbell died. And um, as, so uh, Fred, Fred was dysfunctional. We buried, we buried them both. And then I said about trying to, 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 to sell this half completed opus. Uh, and again, I got turned down and turned down and turned down. Meanwhile, Bill Moyers on his own was, had come back to PBS and took the production fund and was editing his conversations with Joe and announced to PBS that he was going to do a six part series uh, with an 80 year old mythologist. And he got the response, well, that's really sexy TV, and that's really going to bring in a younger audience, isn't it? <laughs> um, long story short, uh, in the beginning, only three PBS stations picked up the series. And then each week it would be like what we'd call a graduated rollout. More people heard about it, more buzz started, more stations picked it up. And overnight, um, all of the, you know, Campbell became a name. I walked down... Uh, Broadway and there used to be a big Barnes and Noble and there was a folding table that they pulled out onto the sidewalk and there was a hand lettered sign that said mythology and they pulled anything they could find from the shelves that, that they thought had anything to do with it and they'd stacked it on this table and suddenly all these publishers that had turned us down wanted the book and they wanted in. Meanwhile I was winding down uh, the publishing company trying to place the books we had in production elsewhere um, but we didn't, you know, th we didn't know that this phenomenon was going to happen. But right. so, so it was a, a, a complete example of, of, of 
of just being pulled by this sense of this is what you need to do um, and doing it. Uh, you know, Joe was a great example of this. I mean, I look back and I, you know, my immediate analogy from that meeting at the Century Club was Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, you know, hey, let's do the show. I, I got a stage. <laughs> I got costumes. Let's start a publishing company. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And then well, eventually that led to the foundation. And people are still discovering his work through those interviews. I mean, because now that things, the technology that we have and, and the way they can, can, and so it's uh, it's been amazing. So let's talk about myth. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about, um, first of all, what is your, you know, what is the your definition of myth? Because some people are gonna think something totally different than, than where we're gonna go here. So well, most people, when they hear myth, say myth is a lie, okay? Um, from Campbell's perspective, myth is another person's religion. Uh, it, 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 is the, it is the fabric of stories and lessons that lead a person to do or not do whatever they do. So let's say for a minute now that you're, you're a Buddhist and, and I'm a Christian. Well, my Christianity is my faith. It's my belief. But that Buddhism stuff you're doing, that's a myth. And, of course, it would be the other way around. Um, what I like to think about, though, to understand it even more, as Campbell would say, a myth is a metaphor, meaning you draw upon something that is real, that you can touch, that is around you, and you use that, as a poet would, to talk about something that you can't otherwise describe, that you can't otherwise wrap your arm around. So these, these stories that come down to us, um, they're drawn from the environment in which, in which they work. I think a great example is, you know, the large portions of the world, the people of the book, those, those come out of the Middle East and a desert culture. Uh, when those stories originally like moved to the, to, the, to the coast where they don't know from desert or scarcity, um, th they were without, uh, you know, they, they, they were interpreted str I'll give you a good example. Um, you know, in, in the Christian tradition, Christ is a shepherd. And, and that's right. traditionally ideal that, that he lead, the shepherd leads the sheep. But if you've ever been on a farm or around a shepherd, shepherds don't lead sheep. They go behind them, okay? And they move them forward. And if a sheep wanders off, they bring them back in. But that, that whole story, that whole metaphor, that whole myth, if you don't have that experience, doesn't mean anything to you. And uh, so, so, so the myths are the are are the uh, fabric uh, create the warp and the woof of the fabric of our life, um, either consciously or unconsciously, um, b because we all grow up in that. You know, um, again, to, to turn to Campbell, we we have two births. One is the physical birth, and the other is the birth into our culture, and it's the birth into the culture where we are wrapped in the myths and the stories and the traditions of who we are and parathetically who we're not, you know, well, whatever else we are, we're not the people over on that hillside. However, let's, let's, let's think about the fact that, um, we, we are, have, have been separated into our cultures, yeah. but now things are different. Um, just talking about the blue marble photograph uh, and how that changed our, because there's no, there's no lines drawn on the world. Well, well, Campbell felt it was a real seminal moment. Um, and we just celebrated, you know, the 50th anniversary of that. Yes. But ironically, seeing that, it, well, first of all, that image wasn't released. Uh, NASA held it. It was, it was Stuart Brand who started Whole Earth Catalog, who started the campaign to get NASA to release that image. The crazy thing is, we saw it through the eyes of our, our, of our fellows, but it really didn't bring us together. Um, you know, it, it didn't. What has brought us together? Coronavirus. Mm. It's the first thing in my experience, and I would say in, 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 in contemporary knowledge, where everybody on the planet is facing the same unknown, um, and there's nobody to blame. I mean, we, some people tried to call it the Chinese virus, or there's a poor woman who was scapegoated as being the one who brought it back here. It, but there is no other as a result. There's no 
person who is not affected by this. Uh, so, you know, it, they say the things that bring people together, either, you know, a common enemy, a, a common charismatic leader, or some set of beliefs. Well, th there is no global czar of the earth. Um, you know, and, and, and we don't share common beliefs. We are trying to learn to do that as, you know, as, as the people who move in next door come from a very different place. And, you know, I'm neighborly, I begin to say, oh, they're, they're, they're not so crazy, not so bad. But that hasn't happened globally. What we've been faced with now is a common enemy, okay? And an enemy about which we know so little. Um, there's nobody to blame. We're all dealing with the same phenomenon. And, and so, it, it, and it has paradoxically brought us together. Um, and, you know, you see, you see scientists and labs in different countries. You see not-for-profit and for-profit labs. You see everybody suddenly working to deal with this, this, this thing that has laid us low, that has separated us from each other, even as it's brought us together. So we, I think it, it's a paradox there. Absolutely. It brings, a, you know, it's an interesting thing when you think about how quickly we could fly from one place to the other. And, you know, we had plans to to be uh, overseas uh, this next year. And all of that came to this screeching halt. Planes are grounded. Things are, you know, and it completely, um, I think it, I think it has forced people to really think about life and how easily we were accessing uh, other areas of the world and what that really means we don't know yet right now for the future no we, we really don't um go ahead just as and as our cultures i mean we we were it is kind of a collision is it not i mean in some ways of all, all of us having to bring together the to the common things that we have together that we that we all share and health being you know that for everyone around the globe and it's really, it's really shown um, the, the, the disparities and the cracks in our society in general. I mean, you and I know that we have the luxury and the ability to be at home, to work from home. What about all the people who don't? Uh, what about the people who, who, who go out daily and risk their lives um, you know, to, to, to get us our, our groceries or, 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 or these, you know, and, and, and these are the people who can't, not work, uh, and 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 you see it across. I, I saw you know lines of people lined up in Las Vegas, four miles long, to get food supplies. Okay, and what I what I noticed immediately was this four mile long row of shiny cars. And why did I notice that? Because just that morning I'd seen a photograph of ragged individuals lined up in India to try to get like a mango off the back of this truck. Mm -hmm. And it was in the context of an article where one person said, I know, I know I'm risking this. I know I'm defying the stay at home. Um, I'm risking this disease, but if I don't do this, I'll starve. You know, they weren't in shiny cars. They were barefoot, you know, and they right. weren't getting bags of beef and potatoes. And, and I don't begrudge anybody that. You know, um, right. if you have need, need you, you need to be humble enough to acknowledge you have need. But, but the, the contrast in the two cultures was, was shocking to me. Uh, and I never would have thought of it. So in this, you know, um, Campbell talks about the hermit's life. And what has this done um, during this virus time? What, how can we how can we look at our hermit's life that is staying indoors and not being out? What, is, what are some of the benefits of that that we can use this for? Well, you know, I mean, we can do what hermits do, which is meditate. We can, you know, we can sit with the stillness. Uh, th there's the last line of a poem by Milton that goes, they also, they also serve who only stand and wait. That's the hardest thing because our impulse is fix it. Mine is do, go, act. And we're being told no. The noble thing is not act. The noble thing, like the like the Tao, you know, to, the best way to do is to be. Um, very very hard to do. And and another thing that I think is is interesting. We've always thought about, and you know, this is underneath the hero's journey, which is a horse that's been ridden for many a mile. Um, 
the, the, the hero goes forth from the village into the forest adventurous. Okay, we can't go, we can't do that. But we know that the the forest is is a is a metaphor. Now it's a metaphor for the unknown um, that you go into. So what's our forest now? Um, it's the future, and it's our interior life. So even as we don't go anywhere or do anything, we're called to an adventure of self-exploration. Um, and it's, it's out of that, I believe, that we're entering a, an unknown future. And hopefully, as it's always been the case, it's going to be the artists who come back with the music and the plays and the films and the images and the sculpture and the art that give us a glimpse of, of what we're commonly experiencing. Um, you know, gets, that goes beyond the words. It goes beyond... You know, it goes beyond the stories, beyond the myths as they've come down to us, certainly beyond what we read in the pages of a dusty old book. Uh, so I think yeah. it, it, it's fundamentally changed. Uh, it, it, we don't know how. We don't know what it's going to be like. We just know it's not what it was. For my own personal life, with my, uh, with my girls, I have discovered it's, it's kind of interesting because I, um, we call them adventures. Uh, there's been a centipede adventure there's been a millipede adventure <laughs> big ones texas large things there's been snails there's been butterflies there's been hummingbirds there's all these different things that we have come across that have helped us um on really that inward journey you know in that in that um awareness of of uh of really kind of a sacred space that we're in right now um that wasn't there before. Yeah, you know, and that curiosity and embracing that curiosity with them, looking at the world through a child's eye, it, 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 it's an antidote to fear. Um, the, the hardest thing I think we have as adults is not, to, I mean, my kids are in their 30s now, but even then, you know, they call up, are you guys okay? You know, and, and they're, they're grappling with existential fear that they never thought they were going to have to, certainly with young kids. So how do you, challenge is how do you not project your fear but how do you embrace you know the, the new experience the curiosity as you as you're doing with your daughters um, it, it, but this is i know you well enough to know that this isn't new okay this is yes. who you are and how you relate to them so it's not like oh my golly mom has become a different person no no you're just now you're just now sharing it with them in a different way um and bravo for that. Uh, yes. It, it, you know, I can't tell you how many people I know who, who, are talk, who are suddenly grappling with the fact they're working from home, their kids are there. How do they, how do they juggle all of this? And, and also, how do they you know, keep the curiosity and keep the adventure and keep it alive for the kids, uh, even as they're thinking, I don't know where my next paycheck is going to come from? Well, you know, and speaking of that, you know, Bob, in the, Joseph Campbell talked about the thou shalt. I'd like to kind of let our, our viewers know a little bit about that. I think that's a, a really interesting thing, especially as I'm, you know, as you're teaching others too, but also in our own lives. Well, where that comes from is, is, is in, his, uh, in his explication of the hero's journey. So when the hero leaves the village and goes into this world of the unexpected, uh, the hero's journey for those of in its raw is separation, uh, initiation and return. So the separation from your quotidian day-to-day -day life and then into a magical world where you meet helpers and all these other things. But ultimately, metaphorically in that world, you have to slay the dragon because the dragon has the pearl. The dragon has the, the thing you want to take back. And mind you, we're talking metaphor now. Uh, the, but the pearl is the boon you bring back, you return to your village with. So... Uh, Joe says you have to, you know, you have to slay, you try to slay the dragon now. And, and the dragon is covered with scales and the scales are, say thou shall or thou shall not. Um, meaning you have to slay all those expectations that you've put on yourself and that society's put on you. Those are the myths, okay? To some extent you have to demythologize. You have to let go of all of that. Um, and, 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 and you fight it. Um, 
you know, when we're, we're growing up and you, know, you fight, you fight the traditions, you fight the laws, you fight the things there. This is part of being an adolescent, right? But ultimately the hero fights and fights and fights against thou shall and thou shalt shall not until the hero lays down his sword and surrenders. Um, meaning what we were just talking about goes into themselves and stops measuring their own adventure against what's out there on the scales of the dragon. And then turns out you don't ultimately scare, you don't slay the dragon. The dragon goes, Oh, okay, I got it. And gives you the pearl. Um, because you're only fighting yourself in that battle. You're fighting the, the remember the second womb. You're fighting all of the things that you learned in that second womb and that you lived into as a member of a given culture or society uh, that it, you know, you can try, you, you can try to suppress them. You can try to rail against them, but ultimately you have to say, okay, this is what it was. And you can't get rid of them. Um, there was a book in the sixties called programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer. And the, uh, the, 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 the takeaway from it was, uh, this is a book by John Lilly. Um, he said you, you, you can't, just like you, you can't get rid of these programs that are in you, but you have to metaprogram them. So you have to come up with a story of your own that acknowledges these, honors these, and goes beyond them. Um, you, know, so you don't just throw it all out. You can't. J Joe says if you try to throw it all out, you are throwing out the dictionary to the language of the soul, which mm -hmm. I think is a great way to think about it. You know? These are all Absolutely. the ways, this is the language of the soul, and you can't get rid of it, but you can take it to another level and a different place. And that's slaying the dragon. And the, and the dragon is, is the one with the scales that say thou shalt and thou shalt not. Mm -hmm. So do we, do we have a, a myth for now? We've got a lot of them. Um, and I think that's one of the, that's one of the, 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 the issues. It, there's, there's collisions of myths. I, I have a, a colleague um, of longstanding who's, who's, who's always, who, for years, was saying to me, you know, we have to create the myth of tomorrow. And, and I would say, no, there, there isn't a myth of tomorrow. You can't create the, what you're going to dream tonight. And myths are for the society like the dream is for the person. What you do is you live into it. You give it form, which is where the artistic impulse comes from. You give it form. And, and, and and if you put it out there, and what's going to happen is every, a lot of people are going to be doing this. And as these things come together, as we share, usually through shared creative experiences, as well as commonalities, you know, we all eat, we all go to the bathroom, we, we all, you know, hope our kids are going to, are, are going to, you know, be well off. We, we have all these common things, but we get caught up in the differences. Um, once you, once you step beyond that, uh, th then I think what you're going to see, and Campbell suggested this, and is there's going to be some common threads. You already cited one of them, Nelda, this recognition of this fragile big blue marble in space, this recognition that, that on there, there are no boundaries, and objectively looking at it, the only tribe that matters is the human tribe. Um, that's going to be one thing. Campbell also says that the, the myths of tomorrow are going to have a common sense of, of, of a long arc, a different sense of time. You know, it's not, forget quarterly reports or annual reports, it's, it's going to be eons, uh, that, you know, that, that we've been around. Um, so, so these are a kind of common touchstones, um, that, and we see those too in the eco ecological movement and other things. They're starting to bubble up all over. I wanted to talk about the warrior's approach because I think it's important that we give, you know, some context, some, some help maybe to people as we're going through all this. And um, so let me read what Campbell wrote. The warrior's approach is to say yes to life, say yay to it all, participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world. We cannot cure the world of sorrows, but we can choose to live in joy. Um, so how do we live joyfully? We're watching other people in pain. We're watching sorrow and, and death and dying going on. But how do we live in that? Well, you know, it's, it's, it is joyful participation. It is, from Buddhist perspective, recognizing that all of the world is sorrow. And yet, you know, that, that quote, too, that, that you was in the middle of Joe's is the Bodhisattva's vow. 
the Bodhisattva being someone who's reached enlightenment, but decides not to step over into enlightenment until all beings are enlightened. And, and so there, you know, that's where we get the joyful participation. Um, but the other thing that, that I, I hear, well, the war, let me stop here. When I was looking, you know, examining this, I live in Mexico City now. And so uh, I read, you know, I, I was reading and I read an article here about the fact that, that pandemics are actually um, not unusual in Mexico City, but the people here today have forgotten about it. And then they went on to talk about uh, 1552 when the, when the smallpox came and smallpox came and it killed, you know, it killed two million. And then 25 years later, there was another another pandemic that the, the Spanish couldn't even name. It killed 18 to 20 million. And then there was a third one about less than that. And and so so, so this is always this has been a part of culture that, that slips out of memory easily. Um, and we forget about it because, in part, we've given over our own self autonomy to gray hairs. I mean, figuratively, to leaders, okay? We were talking about leaders a minute ago. Um, present leader aside, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We're learning that we can't rely on a leader. Um, we can't rely on the doctor to know everything. We can't rely on the most brilliant scientist. Um, we, we have to circle the problem, uh, you know, just like in the theater. Now, the, where if you want to, Isolate a figure in space. You need at least three points of light. You know, you know, three. Else, else the figure doesn't emerge from the background. You need, we need a multiplicity of voices looking at this now, and each one of them has to be the warrior. And in that pandemic, the, the pandemics that came through. Um, the, the, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, and my Spanish isn't good enough. But they said that the only way that the Spanish wrote that the only way to address what was going on was the warrior's way. And then they went on to say the warrior, and this is the translation I, I, I forgive me, I don't have in front of me. What the warrior does is every action is done impeccably as if to thumb one's nose at death. So joy comes from the impeccableness of which, which you do, whatever it is you're doing. You know, suddenly doing dishes, you know, maybe isn't such a shore. And may, maybe that soap bubble, you know, reveals something else. So, but what you do, you do with joy, but you do impeccably. You do it to the best of your ability. And then, you know, if death comes, well, you know, if death comes, I, I, as Mary Oliver says, I want to, to, to leave this world no, knowing that I, I was the bridesmaid, that, you know, I, I took life in my arms. I, I did things impeccably. And so um, when you do things impeccably to the best of your ability, I, I believe, at least this is true for me, I'm filled with joy. If, if, if I'm doing something and judging it, I mean, if, if, you know, how do you paint a picture if every brush stroke you're judging? You don't, you know? You, you, you proceed from, from the, with, with joy even, you know, even in the face of the, of the recognition uh, as Joe says, you know, one, the, the best life is one, one hero's adventure after another, after another, because it's not just one. And he says, and, and you do that in full knowledge of the fact that some of them will be successes and some of them will be disasters. But you still act impeccably and you still go forward. Um, or in this case, you still, you still go in. Boy, do you learn from the disasters, though. You know, <laughs> you learn so much and it is, you know, I, you know, it's said so many different ways by so many different people, but it is really true that when the disasters oftentimes are, are where you learn the most, you know, I think about, uh, I remember one of the, uh, analogies that I read of his was that, um, some people spend their lives climbing up a ladder only to find that they put it on the wrong wall, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, he says that's the true tragedy, and it it is, you know. Yeah. But that that you know kind of takes us back to where we began in the sense that what you do is, is you let go of what you plan. You know, you, you you plan this whole thing, but you plan it knowing that um that it isn't going to happen, and that it might not happen. It, it you know in my case, I think you know if if I look back and 
I look at the people I knew when I was in arts education and they wanted me to get my PhD and, and you know, continue as an arts educator. And I mm -hmm. veered in, in, into experimental theater and, and I was deep into that on the West Coast. I came to the East Coast. Suddenly I found myself swept up in Broadway. Um, you know, and, and just all my friends were going, way, you know, whoa, aren't you lucky? And I was thinking, how do I get out of here? You know, <laughs> how do I get back to my route? So I go to Savannah and that gets knocked out underneath. <laughs> you know, and if that hadn't got knocked out under from underneath me, I never would have never would have met Joe Campbell. If I had right. if I had if I hadn't tried to be of service, um, if I hadn't tried to serve what I saw as a common need there, you know, which was a simple one, yeah, send me the boxes, I'll keep them. I it never would have evolved into into the grand adventure that the publishing company was. Um, if I hadn't gone with that and then suffered through the dissolution of that and having to let go of all of these projects I'd nurtured for years and fold this company into which I'd invested everything, including, including my own living quarters, um, you know, we never would have had the foundation. We, we never would have had, you know, none of that would have happened. And the important part of that is that you could never see that future. That's, yeah. yeah. My friend, my, my late friend, Harry Chapin, in one of his songs, Circle, says, there's no straight lines make up my life and all my roads have bends. There's no clear cut beginning and so far no dead ends. Um, it, and and, and that, that just sings to me um, uh, about what it is. You know, you, if, if, you're, if you're trying to go straight and the road bends, you're going to fall off a cliff, you know? Mm. You it's have true. to recognize that, and there aren't straight lanes in nature. They're, they're all, they all have bends. Um, and, and who can say, you know, I, I'm no different a person now than I was at each of these times I, you know, changed or changed professions or changed direction. You, you know, you're no different where you live now than where you lived before. Uh, you know, the things around you may change, but, but you're you, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting because that, that goes back to that, right, the, the wheel that he spoke about, about living in, in the wheel of our life versus, I guess, the ladders, right? I mean, because it is true. There's lots of movement. There's lots of change and things you never anticipated happening, you know. And I think that when people ask me as an individual what, you know, what taught you the most, it's just when I lost everything. When I lost it all, that's when I really learned so much about me, you know, and um, it, it is sort of a, an interesting thing in our lives that it, um, you know, we can hopefully choose the hero's journey and path with that, right? If you're on a heroic path, you have no choice but to say yay. You, you, you have to say yay to what comes at you, horrible though it may be. Um, I guess the old, in that sense, the only tragedy, true tragedy is when you lose yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can lose yourself to substances, to addiction, to dementia, to, um, you know, you, to any number of things. But typically, it's trying to live into somebody's story of who you're supposed to be. And, you know, in, in, in that same thing of the, the tragedy of the person who gets to the top of the life, the latter, my, my friend and former colleague, Rebecca Armstrong, all, always says, look back and see what your parents wanted you to do. And that's probably what you shouldn't do because they're thinking of your, <laughs> yes. of your security. Okay. Yes. And they're thinking absolutely. of who you are. When, when we moved, when I think I shared this in New York, but when, when we moved to Mexico city, our sons were in their early thirties and we told them we were moving to Mexico city and they said, we need a family meeting. You guys need an intervention. And, uh, <laughs> we had a family meeting and they said, have you thought this through? Are you sure this is the thing you should do? You know, and they, they all the things that we'd said to them as concerned parents when they grew up came right back at us, right <laughs> back at us, you know, um, because, be, because love wants to do that. You know, love wants, wants to hold on to, you know, wants you to be right and well, but that might not be what, where, what, where you want you to be. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've got... That's the scales, isn't it? <laughs> it so is true. I have one of my four that is uh, 
the, the rock climber. And I just, I, I, as she gets older, I look at it and I go, oh, I know where we're headed and I'm going to have to let go and let all that happen, you know, because it's, that's, uh, you know, her love. And so, uh, in, in so many ways, well, before we go, although we could talk for forever. Good. Which is one of the delights of being with you, Melvin. I mean, I think, and I think when we were together at the table in New York, you know, I kept watching them. I knew they wanted to turn that table over. And we were just as, just as certain we weren't going to let them. It is so true. There are two things I want to talk about. And one is bliss. And the other is sacred space. Uh, we are actually, I'm in one of my sacred spaces right now, as you and I are, are talking. And um, it is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a house on the river that I feel so blessed by. But it's, it's my bliss here for me is just being able to kind of commune with nature. That is, that is a, a part of something that feeds my soul. And it's part of um, en- energy giving for me. Uh, if you will. So what can we leave our audience with about learning about bliss and learning about uh, sacred spaces and the importance of them? Well, I think the first thing to leave them with is that bliss isn't always great and joyful and wonderful. Um, True. You know, it, bl- bliss, following your bliss can just be hellacious. Um, and because the bliss is the thing you can't not do. Um, you know, Joe was fond of a passage to one of the Gnostic Gospels, which, uh, which, which spoke of the apostles uh, dancing and singing. And actually, the lyrics to the song are in the Gospel as they accompany Jesus to the cross. Okay? Because he was following his bliss. Uh, he was doing what he had to do. You see a preface to that in the Christian story where, where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and says, don't make me drink of this cup. But you know he has to do it. Um, he's willing to sacrifice himself for the thing that he has to do. That's bliss. But boy, that is enjoyful and bubbly and all wonderful. And you know, which which is unfortunately how that aphorism of Joe's has come down because it's been taken out of the context of the Hinduism um, from mm-hmm. which it came. Whereby bliss is the way to enlightenment. It's, it's to your true self. That's one of the three ways. So, so, so bliss is there, but to, to segue, and I think you put, it was really sweet of you to put these two things together because I think it's important, and that's sacred space. Um, sacred space, it, is, it can be a physical space. It's great if it is a spa- physical space or if it is you know, nature or, or a, a particular tree you want to sit under, but it's the place where you step outside of all of the demands of your day-to-day. And that's where you go to get in touch with your bliss. You know, um, artists who have a studio, dancers have a studio. You know, maybe the uh, maybe the um, musician has a practice room. But I'll give you an example too of uh, this, that's very immediate to me. We have some wonderful downstairs neighbors who befriended us and and made us feel right at home. They have two kids. It, by the way, it turns out that they're that their eight-year-old is just a mythology nut. And when, uh, when <laughs> one of their relatives Googled me, um, and I don't speak enough Spanish, so I have a great friend here who, who's, who is a mythologist and invited them to dinner, and this six-year-old, just eight-year-old, just knocked his socks off. Um, but their daughter came up the other day, and, and she's learning English. Um, she's halting at it. She, she's, I would say, maybe 12 in that neighborhood. And she gave us a little sheet of paper, and she said, my, my assignment, my school assignment that I'm working on now is spreading joy and, uh, and spreading joy in the face of the pain. And she said, so what I'm going to do is every day this week at five o'clock, I'm going to go out on my little veranda, which overlooks this, this sort of courtyard where they park cars, and I'm going to play music and I'm going to play my violin. And she gave it, she went through the building and she gave us you know, the program of what she was going to do each day at five. And, you know, and they're short pieces and, and you know, uh, she, she's not some Chinese, she's very good, but she's not a Chinese virtuoso. You could see the, the reaching out to everybody in the building, first of all, was nervous making enough. Um, but then, you know, she does this te- and 
sure enough, the first day she paid, people came out on their little balconies all up and down in, inside this courtyard. And, and, you know, she played two little pieces at the end of which, you know, of choruses of Bravo and Bravissima and, and everybody was applauding. It was much like, you know, the, the footage we see of people in Italy or Spain coming out, and, right. you know, at a certain day and applauding or, or applauding the service workers, which they do in New York. We were all applauding her because she was bringing joy and she was bringing yes. joy by doing this thing that was close to her and offering it up to all of us. And it brought all of us together in a way that I've never seen. And it continues. We still have two more days of music. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's, that's an example of using your own bliss to be of service to the community. Um, and, and it is frequently through those creative impulses that that happens. Mm. That's beautiful. So, so, so find a place, I mean, to speak to the people who are listening to this, find a place where you feel totally yourself and go there periodically. Find out what you like to do and do more of it. Um, do it with joy. Do it with joy in the face of the pain that's all around you. No, you can't, you can't get rid of the pain, but you can, as, this, as our young neighbor does, you can spread joy. Mm, that is so true. That is so true. Bob, thank you for being with me. Oh, no, no <laughs> pleasure anytime. <laughs> Even without the margaritas, it's a joy. <laughs> and audience, thank you, guys. You know the, the drill. We'd love for you to uh, like and subscribe and uh, turn on your notifications. Uh, we have future episodes with other people that we'll be interviewing. Um, and, and Bob, is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with? No, simply stay safe, stay healthy, stay strong wrong and be yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And where can people find your work? Yeah. JCF for Joseph Campbell Foundation. JCF.org. Uh, hey, there's lots right. of treasures there. So there's lots of Campbell and other things there. Okay. We will certainly put that up for them. All right. Thank you so much.